Dr. Ben Bickman, when we look at GLP-1s, one of the labs that you used to be at, ECU, was mm -hmm. one of the labs that really pioneered some of the early research with GLP-1, which we now know of as Ozempic and Wagovi yep. and yada, yada. Yep. Uh, but GLP-1 research as it pertains to GLP-1 in the body, not just a receptor agonist like mm -hmm. the compounds, right? Yeah. Um, let's just do a little bit of a deep dive and understand like the good, the bad, the ugly. Like, What mm -hmm. is GLP-1? How is it discovered? What does it do? Now, after this video, I put a link down below for 40% off Sundays. Now, I have four dogs. I'll tell you, we feed them Sundays because it's human grade dog food. So that means it's good quality food that a human could eat themselves. You might be wondering, this is really random to have a commercial for dog food on a health channel. Bottom line is, this channel is also about my life and I talk about things that I use and that's how sponsors come on this channel. So that is a 40% off discount for Sunday's human grade dog food. It was formulated by a veterinarian that really saw a serious need to feed higher quality food to our dogs. So that link down below gets you 40 40% off. If you've got pups and you care about health, it's probably an interesting fit. Check them out down below. And when these GLP-1 based drugs were first used, they were used at a relatively lower dose, a low enough dose where the main effect was to simply inhibit glucagon. And thus the main clinical outcome was you were controlling glucose levels better. And thus, finally, it was only used for type 2 diabetes. However, um, these shrewd scientists, and I don't mean that in any kind of negative way, noticed that these people <clears throat> also tended to eat a little less. They just had a slightly better satiety. <clears throat> they were eating a little less and losing a little weight. That then became the focus for this kind of new version of the drugs <clears throat> where they wanted to, now they wanted to not only control the glucagon and improve glucose levels in the diabetic, but because it was so good, at slowing down, so I guess there's myriad mechanisms here that I ought to mention, but the net effect being that they also discovered that at higher doses, it became profoundly effective at controlling um, weight. And so, the, so then it got marketed as a weight loss drug when it used to only be marketed as a diabetes drug. It was purely an anti-diabetic. And most people will really get a kick out of this if morbidly so. The only difference between these drugs is the dose that it's, it's the same exact molecule, but it's just ramped up in the dose. And the, the oddities of, of filing patents um, means that you can use the same molecule and you can patent the dose of the molecule in a particular range and call it a whole new drug and it's a whole new patent and protect that dose. And so at the lower dose, again, it primarily acted by controlling glucagon, which improved glucose and thus helped with diabetes. At these higher doses, and we'll see how high the dose continues to get, um, then its primary mechanism was generally twofold, although GLP-1 activation does more than just these two things. One was to activate satiety centers in the brain directly. So these GLP-1 GLP itself, as a peptide hormone that comes from the guts, or whether you are mimicking its effect in a much stronger way, um, with these drugs, one effect will be to tell the brain that we don't need to eat. So there's a central activity of the satiety centers of the in the hypothalamus. Related but distinct from this, at these higher doses, it slows peristalsis. So GLP-1 has this natural effect to slow the rate at which the food is moving through the intestines. That's a natural phenomenon. With these um, weight loss drugs that are based on GLP-1, you've taken the body's natural GLP-1 signaling and taken it really off the charts. It, it gets so high. This actually can become a problem where you take the natural slowing effect of GLP-1, it's slowing the intestines and you can freeze them, you can paralyze them entirely. There are published case reports documented reports of people who experience full-on paralysis of their intestines because of the use of these drugs. Now, that's an uncommon response, and it might be people who are abusing the drug and like double dosing, which happens, um, but still, it's a warning where it, it, slows, it can slow the intestines down too much. But even in its natural rate of slowing with the normal use of the drug, what's interesting with the, these drugs is what happens when someone goes into surgery. Normally, if someone's going to go under general anesthesia, they will be told, don't eat for 24 hours so that your stomach is totally empty to reduce the chances of you vomiting during the nausea that comes with the anesthesia. Um, and that can complicate, of course, everything if you're vomiting into all of this hardware that's across your face. But what they found was that people who were on these weight loss drugs, even though they hadn't eaten in 24 hours, still had a stomach full of food. 
And, and so that changes the whole formula. If someone's on these weight loss drugs and they have to go under and go asleep with general anesthesia, they need an even, they have to get off the drug for a period of time to actually allow the stomach to fully empty. But even then, a person who's on the drugs will notice that they have a much more putrid breath and that they're, they, they're burping, these kind of noxious, stinky fumes because they have a lot of food that's staying in their stomach for 24 or 36 hours. And it literally starts to go a little putrid in the stomach because you've slowed everything down I would say too much in that instance. But that's the main where people talk about, I take these drugs and my food, my food cravings go away. That's a very nice way of saying, I feel kind of sick to my stomach all the time, a little bit. And so I just don't even want to eat. Food doesn't interest me because I feel a little sick. That's the, the blunt way of saying my, my cravings are controlled. But independent of that, there are a couple other noteworthy effects of GLP-1 that should be mentioned in all fairness that can also explain how it is helpful for weight loss. One, it does activate lipolysis and fat mobilization and fat burning. And then second, it also stimulates the activity of brown adipose tissue. In a previous conversation, you and I have talked about uncoupling where you have the metabolic engine is revving the engine, but not because the cell is busy. It's not because you're getting out and running 10K. In the case of the fat, of the brown fat in particular, which humans have sprinkled through the thoracic cavity, brown fat has a very high metabolic rate just to create heat. And, and, and we know in human studies, if you activate brown fat more often, you have a much greater chance at staying lean or being lean and less chance becoming diabetic. And GLP-1 stimulates brown adipose tissue. So we have these multiple favorable metabolic uh, effects of GLP-1, which makes us all appreciate GLP-1, certainly as we are making it ourselves and altering our diet, you know, by trying to increase our GLP-1. But when it comes to these weight loss drugs, there are some consequences, which is the composition of the weight loss. So a very good paper was published about a year or two ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the preeminent biomedical journals. They found that up to 40% of the weight that people lose on these GLP-1-based drugs is coming from fat-free mass. Now that can encompass a lot, including water, but it also encompasses muscle and bone. So you have a substantial amount of lean mass that's getting lost as the person is losing weight. So to make that clear, for every 10 pounds of weight loss, only six is fat and four of it is coming from non-fat sources like potentially muscle and bone. That is very important because 24 months in on these drugs in the US, about 70% of people who are on these drugs choose to get off the drugs themselves. It's not the clinician who gets them off it. They say, I'm done. I don't want to be in this drug anymore, which is really relevant. If you have 70% of people, two thirds, over two thirds of people wanting to get off it on their own, what happens when they get off it? That's what we should be looking at. And of course, the weight regain begins immediately. And two years later, they're within just a few pounds of where they started. If you, they're on the drug for two years, let's say they've lost 30 pounds. Two years later, they're within, maybe they've gained back 25 pounds. However, we don't gain all of that same weight back that we lost. So if 40% of what we lost was lean mass, 60% was fat mass. If we were talking about a young, healthy 25 year old male, okay, no problem. He can gain that muscle and bone mass back pretty well. But if we're talking about a 65 year old woman, who's gotten on this drug, she is never getting that muscle and bone mass back. So as much as she has regained 95% of her fat that she had lost, as a percent, she's probably fatter than before she ever started the drug in the first place. Because while we lost 60% of our weight was fat, when we regain it, we're not, especially in that older woman, just as an example, even an older man to a de same degree, similar degree, the muscle and the bone mass will not be restored like the fat mass. It's just one of the particular tragedies of human physiology. We regain fat mass very, very easily, whereas muscle and bone mass may not ever come back. And so again, as a percent, even though on the scale, they're five pounds lighter than when they started, as a percent, they're probably fatter than when they ever started. Is there a uh, a tolerance or even like a, like a feedback loop that gets disrupted with using these, you know, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, it's one that I've made a particular point of wanting to understand. It's not uncommon in certain situations where if you were taking in a particular drug 
If it is acting like a hormone, the body's endogenous production of that same hormone goes down. I mean, the most obvious example would be like anabolic steroids. If, if, if we were taking anabolic steroids, test, you know, androgen, testosterone based, our own production starts to become replaced. Um, in GLP-1, there is no evidence that I'm aware of that that happens, that the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist drugs are preventing our own intestines ability to produce GLP-1. I, I know of no study that's shown that. However, there is some evidence to show that the use of these GLP-1 based drugs reduces the sensitivity to GLP-1. So there, there, there could be, this was a, this was what's called an in vitro study. So a cell culture based study. So full disclosure, I don't know of any comparable evidence in humans. So time will tell um, if in our more honest moments, we're able to discover and share that kind of result. Um, but at least in a cell culture model, there does appear to be a reduction in sensitivity to GLP-1 with the chronic exposure to these drugs, which is not surprising. Yeah. This is that that phenomenon reflects generally a fundamental biological principle, which is too much of something will result in a resistance to that something. You know, we're getting too much stimulus. The cell, if it can, will say, "All right, I just I have to I have to kind of tone that signal down." There's just too much. Yeah, and that could definitely be problematic for someone that, you know, they lost 50 pounds, they decreased their metabolic rate mm -hmm, already because mm -hmm. they'd lost so much weight and a lot of muscle mass and yep. bringing that BMR down. And then on top of that, when they do go back to eating their normal diet, they're getting less satiety from it potentially, yeah, right? And that's so right. it's like they go and they eat a stalk of asparagus that would yep. normally give them enough fiber to trigger that GLP-1 response. Maybe they're getting, I mean, this purely hypothetical, yeah, yeah. half of that, right? Yep. So it's like, then they want to eat more at a lower metabolic rate, and then you know, fat accumulation would- Oh yeah, yeah, and that absolutely starts to play into a vicious cycle that needs to be considered on the back end of these drugs. Because again, 70% of people are choosing to get off them. Yeah. Now I can't, cite all the reasons why, but I don't want, I don't want someone listening to this to think that Dr. Bickman, this obesity scientist is uniformly opposed to these drugs. I, I'm not. When they were in their original dose, I actually looked at them as one of the more remarkable drugs. Because every drug, as I teach these principles to students, every drug is a balance of it's you're putting you're you're putting something in the body that doesn't belong there or in some altered form. Are the consequences you want worth the consequences you don't want because it's all a bag of consequences. What's the effect of what I'm putting in my body? Ideally, the consequences we want are worth the consequences we don't want. At this original lower dose, I considered this to actually be a favorable balance. That boy, this is really helping people um, control their blood sugar levels. And the fact that it would help with their cravings, further helping control their blood sugar, boy, these are awesome. Now that we've gone to these literal multiples and doses, yeah. I it is becoming the higher the dose is getting, the harder it's getting for me to look at them favorably. But now we have what is just always it's inevitable. You find that the dose can only go so high. And then what you start to do is you start to couple that drug with another one. And now you have these kind of mixed patents where it's the use of this drug with another compound yeah. to try to offset that effect. 